Lewis structure is used by chemists to do an accounting of where the valence electrons responsible for bonding are located in a molecule. Now, if we call that all of what we call chemistry uh, take, takes place because of valence electrons. The core electrons don't participate in chemical reactions. So Lewis structures help chemists predict the 3D shape of a molecule. So before we can start talking about the shapes of molecules, we have to know where the electrons are. So how do we draw a Lewis structure? First of all, we count up the total number of valence electrons and the elements involved. For nonmetals, uh, the number of valence electrons is its group number minus 10. So for example, fluorine is a group 17 metal. Uh, 17 minus 10 gives you 7 valence electrons. So each valence electron within a molecule, uh, each, each halogen within a molecule would count for 7 electrons if there were multiple halogens within the molecule. For metals, you, the number of valence electrons is equal to the group that the metal is in. Number two, choose the central atom, then draw it in the middle with lines connecting to all the other atoms. Each line uses up two electrons. So whenever we draw a line in Lewis structures, it equals to two electrons. Third, stick the extra electrons in pairs onto the satellite atoms. Fourthly, any extra electrons that are left over are placed on the central atom. Fifth rule, we check for octet and charge rule compliance. And then we adjust the structure. The octet rule says that most atoms will accommodate eight electrons. And when you count up for octets, a bond is worth two, and a lone pair equals two. Of course, if, you're, um, if your atom has 15 protons or more, like phosphorus, then it can sometimes accommodate expanded octets, meaning there are more than eight electrons in its vicinity. And for atoms like boron and uh, beryllium, you'll have diminished octets. The charge rule says that atoms will usually require as many electrons as contained in their valence shell. Um, and when you have a bond going to an atom, it counts for one electron, and a lone pair counts for two. Now, if we do a couple of worked out examples, you'll see how those rules apply. Let's draw a little structure of ammonia. First of all, we count up how many valence electrons are present in the constituents of ammonia, which is NH3. There are five for uh, nitrogen, and three for uh, one for each hydrogen, of which there are three, so a total of eight electrons appear in ammonia. So when we draw ammonia, we put the central atom in, as nitrogen, and then we, throw, uh, we, we put the hydrogen atoms as satellites. That uses up six electrons. These three bonds use up six electrons, and then the last two electrons are placed on the central atom. So that uses up eight electrons. Then what we do is we check for octets and the charge. The octet for nitrogen is satisfied because we have two, four, six, eight. Recall that for the octet, um, a line is worth two electrons, and the lone pair is worth two electrons as well. So there are eight electrons in the vicinity of, ni of, vicinity of nitrogen, and the charge consideration is also satisfied. When you count up charges, the bonds count for one. So nitrogen, which has five valence electrons, likes to have possession of five electrons. Well, in this situation, has one, two, three, plus the two from the lone pair, so a total of five. So nitrogen has no formal charge. The hydrogen likes to accommodate one valence electron, and it has a duet, not an octet. So this counts as two. So the octet requirement, so-called, is, um, is met for hydrogen, and the charge requirement is met as well. For ammonium, ammonium has the formula NH4+. Plus. When you count up the electrons, you put a one uh, plus charge, which means that one electron is subtracted from the total formula. Nitrogen is five, four hydrogens each have one, and then you subtract one, so you again have eight electrons in the Lewis structure for ammonium. When you draw it up, you'll see that there are four lines going to nitrogen. So nitrogen has a fulfilled octet, but only has four out of the five electrons that it wants in its valence shell, so it will have a former charge of plus one. All the hydrogens are five. And I took the liberty of doing nitrogen triiodide, although I, um, well, it's not a very stable compound, it's actually explosive. It's a, unstable in that uh, it could be detonated when it's dry. Uh, nitrogen has five electrons, iodine has seven, and there are three iodine atoms. So this, this is a compound that's analogous to ammonia, and you'll see that it, take, that it has 26 electrons in it. So in this case, 
uh, we put the three bonds going to the, uh, the iodine atoms, and then that only uses up six electrons. So what we do is we put six electrons around each iodine atom, so that uh, because we realize that iodine likes to have seven valence electrons. And then once we've done that, it uses up 24 electrons. The last two we place on the central atom. Now let's check for octet requirements. We'll start with nitrogen. Nitrogen has two, four, six, eight, so its octet requirement is met. As regarding charge, uh, nitrogen likes to have possession of five electrons. So it possesses one, two, three, plus the two here, that's five. So its charge requirement is met. Iodine likes to have a fulfilled octet, two, four, six, plus the one, uh, plus this uh, the bond, which also accounts for two, so two, four, six, eight. The octet requirement for iodine is met. And the charge for iodine, um, iodine likes to have possession of seven electrons. And as we recall, that bonds count for one when it comes to charge requirements. So one plus the two, four, six, six plus one is seven. There is no charge on iodine. So all the iodines are they're similar. They all meet the charge and octet requirement. This would be the a valid Lewis structure for nitrogen triiodide. The next one, we look at phosphate. Phosphate. Uh, the phosphate anion has a negative three charge, so we count five for the phosphorus and uh, six electrons for each, uh, for each oxygen atom. Remember, oxygen is in group 16 of the periodic table, uh, and if you, if you subtract 10 from 16, you get six, so that's how many valence electrons oxygen likes to have. Six times four gives you 24, because there are four uh, oxygen atoms in phosphorus, in phosphate, sorry, um, and then add an extra three electrons with a negative three charge. So the total number of electrons in the phosphate anion is 32. We begin by writing the phosphorus atom as the central atom. We connect each oxygen atom with a bond. That uses up eight electrons right there. So we still have to use up 24. So what we do is we'll put six on each oxygen atom and then see how that works. We find that when we draw that Lewis structure, we end up with formal charges on, on just about every atom in the, in the molecule. Phosphorus has a fulfilled octet here, but it would like to have possession of five electrons, but each of these is worth one. So it actually has possession of four electrons, therefore it's left with a formal charge of plus one. The oxygen atoms similarly have fulfilled octets, two, four, six, eight, but because they like to have possession of six electrons, and in this case, they actually have possession of seven. Two, four, six plus the one here gives you seven. So each of the oxygen atoms ends up having a formal charge of minus one. So what we do to remedy that is we take one of the lone pairs on the oxygen and we shift it down in, um, to, as a bonding pair. From lone pair, we turn it into a bonding pair. And this is the molecule that we propose as the Lewis structure for phosphate. And what happens is this oxygen loses its formal charge and these three remain the same, and what ends up happening is that phosphorus has an expanded octet, so it has more than eight, but it can accommodate the more than eight because it's uh, got an atomic number 15 or higher. That's the sort of cutoff point in the periodic table. Uh, the oxygen atoms still have their formal charges, so this whole molecule is minus three overall, just like it's portrayed in the, in the um, picture for the anion. But what, what you need to realize is this does not actually exist. And traditionally we draw the different canonical structures, but what you have to realize is that the electrons are moving at two-thirds the speed of light. So they're whizzing around in there, and they're actually distributed evenly, evenly among those four positions. So what we really have is five bonds distributed over four positions. It's more accurate to say the bond character of phosphate anion is one and one quarter, because five bonds are shared over four positions.